able to uh, provide some publicity for work by some um, an allied uh, a series of people um, in Idaho. Uh, this is social justice ideology in Idaho higher education, um, where the two co-authors are Scott Yenor, a Washington fellow at Claremont Center for the American Way of Life, and Anna K. Miller, an education analyst at the Idaho Freedom Foundation. And I should say the Idaho Freedom Foundation has sponsored this report. So, and, and uh, we're just delighted that they're doing this um, in fact, you know, independently of us, but they're interested in the same sort of stuff as the NAS. And indeed, we have published Social Justice Education in America. Uh, what we always wanted <laughs> was to have um, somebody doing local uh, investigations of social justice in individual universities and colleges in the individual states to try to make real policy change at the university and state level. And this is what the Idaho Freedom Foundation, Scott and Anna are doing. So it's, it's just wonderful and extraordinary. What we're here then is to hear them talking about the substance of their report, and then also ideally something of the how-to, because this ought to be happening everywhere, and they're showing how this can be done. So we're going to be getting first, you know, I think 20 minutes each, first Scott, then Anna, then there'll be some moderated discussion and questions, and then uh, questions from the audience. Uh, please, your tabs at the bottom of the screen, there's both a chat and a Q&A. Please put your questions into either. I will try to relay them and or Scott and Anna will maybe be you know, answering some of them directly. And um, any question that doesn't get answered, please send to me afterwards. That's randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L at nas.org. I'll pass them on to Scott and Anna afterwards. So you never need to worry about your questions not getting answered. It'll get there sooner or later. And um, oh, and sorry, not to keep you from speaking, uh, this is being recorded. It will be posted. People who want to see the link, it'll be up on the NAS um, YouTube channel within 24 hours, and frankly, usually within six or so. Um, so everyone will have a chance to see this afterwards. Okay, so the uh, two things uh, that are being mentioned, Scott, assessing social justice plans for a particular university, and Anna, measuring social justice ideology in the curriculum. And uh, Scott, first, if you'd be so kind. Thank you, David, and thanks everyone for joining us. I wanna thank NAS. I'm a proud lifetime member of NAS and uh, for all the great work that they did. And uh, David's work, um, Social Justice Education in America, actually inspired me with the idea of, uh, of completing such a task uh, when it comes to each of uh, Idaho's universities. There's been some controversy here over the last few years um, as the university president, uh, the past university presidents have founded commissions on diversity and inclusion and, and relayed long-term plans for how Boise State was to be transformed from a culture uh, that represented the dominant norms of society into one that is more welcoming. And uh, we all know that these are kind of in our news speak, a sort of code word for uh, building up an infrastructure uh, on campus that represents critical race theory or social justice education, whatever term you wanna use uh, to describe it. So as, as this has been in the news here, we thought that developing an objective way of measuring the development of social justice ideology on each of our campuses was a most needful thing. And uh, so uh, I allied with uh, friends at Idaho Freedom and Anna to, uh, to design a way of assessing how deeply social justice ideology has penetrated the plans of the university, the curriculum of the university, the student life of the university, and the, you know, the university as a whole, really. And, uh, and these are categories I think that every university has and every, every uh, public university should be evaluated. Uh, we did some data ga gathering. We, uh, we hired someone to put together a list of all the required uh, classes in the general ed offerings. 
uh, to put the course descriptions in a file. And then we judged each of those according to certain standards. We did uh, a lot of archival work when it came to uh, finding uh, plans that the university had made, reports that the universities had made, and uh, about how they are going to you know, promote diversity, inclusion, and equity on the campuses. And uh, the, most of them are public, and, um, and we've used those reports to, to try to shape the way Boise State thinks about diversity, inclusion, and equity on its own campus, and why it, uh, and, and the various ways in which Boise State is going to go about trying to uh, extend the reach of those particular values and this particular ideology. And uh, what Anne and I are doing today is uh, we're dividing up the labor when it comes to what we look for. Um, and uh, what we look for, um, two broad categories were what the administration plans to do and what uh, the curriculum and student life is like. And, uh, and what I'm gonna do is talk about how, what, what we found when we investigated the administrative plans and, uh, and how we went about finding it. And then Anna's gonna talk about the curricular and student life aspect of it. And then, uh, and then that, this is something that we're both very persuaded can be, as I said before, um, duplicated at other universities. I think you can take basically our introduction where we talk about what social justice ideology is uh, and, you know, copy and paste that and say, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna look into how far it has reached into universities. I think you can take our first page about what administration is on a campus and, uh, and what they can do when it comes to any particular policy. And then we're drilling down and looking at what they're doing on this policy. I think uh, the introduction to the student life slash curriculum section can just be a cut and pasted from our report and used at other universities. So our, our hope is that what we've done here is very reproducible uh, in the structure, and then you have to fill in what is happening at your universities. And if we could get you know, a group of something like 100 universities to analyze, we could rank them. We could, uh, we, could, we could actually do a scientific study of how the universities themselves are captured by this ideology. So once again, I, I hope that uh, that these reports can be reproduced uh, elsewhere in the country and that we can, uh, and we're happy to make our stuff available um, uh, if you wanna contact us uh, for such things, but we'll, we'll get to that uh, at the end of our talk today. So, so administration, uh, that's my portfolio. I'm gonna talk about the administration uh, and what we investigated. Now, Anna and I are both, we're, we're almost done with our second report on the University of Idaho. And, uh, and we have two pages in the report dedicated to what we call how it happened. And that really is just the timeline for the committees that the university has established, the commissions that they've established, the charges for what those committees are and the results or plans made by those committees, and then tracing out the execution of those particular plans. Uh, in Boise State's case, uh, the plans began much later, I think, than other universities. In 2017 is when they began, uh, when the when President Bob Kustra then established a commission on diversity and inclusion, and it released its report in July of 2017. And they announced their plans to transform the university, uh, as they say, from one that is reinforced cultural, structural, and personal norms in rural Idaho to one that is more welcoming and inclusive. And, um, and, and then you know, they, they laid out things that they wanted to do over the next few years in order to accomplish this goal. They talked about a hiring of, of a kind of sub provost level director of diversity and inclusion, changing hiring practices, adopting new kinds of student recruitment measures, um, scholarships for illegal aliens, and, uh, and things were all included uh, in their plans. And uh, there was an interim report that was put out to the university community two years after the initial report in June of 2019, talking about the progress they had made in establishing social justice institutions and policies and practices and curriculum across the, 
um, across the uh, university. And, uh, and they announced in that particular moment that they're going to now uh, begin a job search for a vice provost for equity and inclusion. So now they're gonna kick it up to a higher level. And, um, and, and, and that job was posted and that's also in the timeline. Um, and so in other words, it was you know, just using the university's pub mostly publicly available documents. They actually buried one of these documents, but that we had it saved somewhere. Um, using their documents to just explain without moralizing or, um, or condemning what was going on, but just explaining what they themselves say that they are doing to the university. They say it openly and proudly on the university campus to their colleagues, but when the legislature sees it, they have a different attitude. So uh, when you look at such plans and you make such plans publicly available, you put the administration in a position where they have to say something like, we are not building a diversity and inclusion empire at our university, though it is very, very important that we do it. <laughs> and, uh, and if they have to defend that position in front of the legislature, the legislature is much more uh, inclined to ask questions and perhaps act. So, uh, so the first thing that we looked at is this particular timeline. Um, uh, the second thing we looked at is what each individual college says about its own goals when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and equity within the college. And, uh, and they almost all have statements now. Uh, at Boise State, they don't yet have that much by way of hiring in these particular areas. We don't have uh, at the College of Engineering diversity uh, person. We don't have one for the College of Arts and Sciences, but we do have um, you know, statements about shared values on each, um, on, in, on almost every uh, college's website. And uh, so what we did is we think that there's a, um, a, a progression that happens. Uh, you announce shared values then, you uh, th then you make it into part of your strategic plan. When it's part of your strategic plan, you are judged on whether or not you achieve that goal. And if you don't, you ask for more res resources to achieve it. So we think that the announcing of shared values is the first opening wedge into building an apparatus within each of these colleges. Um, that's what happens at most places that have a more sophisticated built out infrastructure for promoting diversity, inclusion and equity. And uh, we think that Boise State, as we say in the report, is beyond the infancy here, but not yet at adolescence um, when it comes to this. But once again, other universities like the University of Idaho are more progressed um, in this particular way. They have uh, actual associate deans in engineering. Um, so, um, so, the, so that's the second thing we look at is the, uh, is the, the dean level, college level, aspirations that the university has made for uh, itself. And the other thing we do in this administrative part is we talk about the policies of the campus. And here we, we uh, follow in the wake of FIRE and uh, use FIRE's way of assessing the university's free speech harassment policies. We try to show the ambiguities or difficulties that are involved in the particular policy. Um, and then there are some uh, policies that are more unique to each institution. So for instance, in Boise State, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Boise Police Department has been recently had its contract uh, severed. And uh, the, uh, the year that they have left on their contract, uh, they have, all the policemen have to take implicit bias training in order to serve on the campus. That's a policy that the university has adopted. Uh, you know, we have it well footnoted. And, uh, and then you know, we, we put that under the policy section. We also put the kind of hiring practices, uh, committee trainings that uh, have to be done in order to get a uh, job search going and uh, brought to completion. Uh, in this case, uh, at Boise State, it's implicit bias training uh, that has to be done for each uh, uh, faculty. There's also faculty training uh, that is now optional but might, become, might uh, as in the nature of things, become mandatory. Uh, and that is that there's uh, how to promote diversity, inclusion, and equity in the classroom. And um, Title IX issues uh, also uh, we discuss. 
uh, Boise State followed uh, the general approach. Uh, it adopted the Dear Colleague letter. And then when the Trump administration under Betsy DeVos um, uh, rescinded it, they rescinded it. And I think they're now fixing to readopt it. Um, and they're doing a lot of, making a lot of uh, sounds about that. And there's some indications that that will probably be happening. Um, so, you know, we really honed in on these policies. Um, and I think uh, it, it allows us to paint a picture, uh, as I say, that the administration where it can act without obstacles and on its own is doing a job of prioritizing this social justice ideology over other aspects of its core educational mission. And uh, having, having shown that uh, in, in these particular areas, we talked about one more thing. And that was that uh, the original, the, the original um, diversity inclusion plan that was put out in July, 2017 established a student board. It's called the Inclusive Excellence Student Council that has really become a third branch of the student government here. And we've tried to chart how they have increased their role in decision-making on campus. And the chief thing that has happened here, I think, is their role with the police. That is this uh, inclusive, excellent student council seems to have been active, first in severing the contract with the police, and second in making it very uncomfortable for vendors on campus who support the police to remain on campus. And in fact, there's been kind of a blow up here about a particular vendor being pushed off campus um, uh, by the university. And, uh, but at the behest of the uh, Inclusive Excellent Student Council. And what's happening here is that these are uh, members of the council are paid by the university through student fees, we think, and, uh, and then given a voice in what vendors are going to be given contracts at the university. And um, so uh, that's something that was established by the university. It's a position that is supported by upper administration, including the Dean of Students and the Director of Diversity and Inclusion that will probably be under the vice uh, provost for diversity and inclusion when that person is hired. And um, so we expect uh, the role of this particular, um, in fact, promises have been made according to the transcripts of the meetings that the students will have an increased role in choosing vendors in the future. So where the, where the administration could act, we've tried to identify the places where they have supported or helped expand the mission of the social justice ideology or critical race theory. and uh, and. Uh, now, it's harder for them to act in other areas like curriculum where they have to face departments who have other kinds of norms and standards. And uh, so we had to try to navigate that. And uh, for uh, our, the account of how we navigated that, I'm going to turn it over to Anna. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Anna Miller with the Idaho Freedom Foundation. Thank you, NAS, for um, having us here today. Um, so I'm going to go over section two of our report. Um, curriculum and student experience. Um, so the first question here is how do we measure social justice education in curriculum and in student experience? So to begin with um, curriculum, basically what we did is we imagined the student experience as a pathway um, through general education and then through a major. Um, we used the course catalog, which is available on universities' websites, and we got course descriptions from that catalog um, for the general education courses. And we use that as a reflection of course content. We also got um, department mission statements, program learning outcomes, um, and requirements for major courses from the course catalog. And so we judged each department or college based on four factors. And those are uh, mission statements, the program learning outcomes, the contributions to the general education, and then required major courses. Um, and then you'll see in our report that we categorize departments further in three different um, three different ways. So red, yellow, or green. Um, red departments, we considered um, to have social justice language infused in all four of the factors I just mentioned. Um, and then for a yellow department, it was just two or three of those factors. And then if a department is categorized as green, that means they have little to no social justice ideology in their programmatic statements. Um, 
So another question is uh, what traits uh, in these factors suggest the presence of social justice ideology? Um, so it really comes down to language and language that affirms diversity, social justice, empathy, inclusion, um, identifying oppressive power structures, things like that, um, aligning the department's mission statement against isms or phobia, so racism, sexism, ableism, classism, uh, homophobia, uh, it goes on and on. Um, and then rejecting or questioning the basis of a national identity or American identity in favor of a global or transnational or subnational identity. And then finally, commitment to activism as opposed to study. These are all things that denote the presence of social justice um, in the four categories that we rated uh, departments on. Um, so like one example of a course that we found that we identify as a social justice course was one general education course um, called University Foundations 200 at Boise State, uh, Themes and Ethics and Diversity. And the description for this course is a history of inequality and marginalization. Um, so this is really just a easy example um, to understand uh, how we categorize things. Um, another example for a mission statement would be the mission statement belonging to the Department of Sociology, which is um, we study the key divisions of a society, the social order, social inequality, social change, race, class, gender, labor, and sexuality. The Department of Sociology is a community for social change, social justice, and equality. Um, so that's another example um, of a, a mission statement we would uh, suggest is a social justice mission statement. Um, we found, interestingly, that even seemingly professional colleges like the College of Business and Economics or the College of Engineering and even the graduate college um, had adopted an emphasis on social justice and their shared values. Um, overall, what we concluded as we went through um, all these requirements was that students cannot avoid um, exposure to social justice in their education, but they can avoid things like American history or government or literature. Um, students cannot graduate at Boise State without taking a minimum of four or five social justice courses in their general education requirements. Um, but then the rest of a student's exposure uh, to social justice education really depends on the major that they choose. And so at Boise State, we identified, for example, six departments in our red category. Um, and some of these were seemingly uh, obvious ones that we kind of expected like gender studies or global studies or sociology, social work, but then even history and criminal justice turned out to be so, uh, heavily infiltrated with social justice and that was a bit surprising. Um, students also at Boise State um, are required to take um, what's called first year writing courses, which a lot of universities have. Um, and at Boise State, this often includes something called service learning or experiential learning. And this is really a way for universities to divert resources, student labor and money to progressive nonprofits. And I know, uh, David Randall, you've written about this in your book um, and explained that it draws from radical ideas like that of John Dewey, uh, revolutionary pedagogy of Paulo Fieri, uh, Mao's China. Um, we didn't expand very much in this report on service learning or experiential learning. Um, going forward and in our next report on the University of Idaho, we plan to dive into this area more. Um, because it's really an area that connotes that connotates that social justice has taken over a certain department because it shows that teachers and students uh, are not engaged in search for knowledge anymore, but instead they're really trying to prepare students for a career in activism. So that brings us to our last section of the report, which is um, residence life. Um, so we evaluated residence halls by looking at uh, residence life mission statements and then who the residence life hires um, considering the personnel as policy. So prior to 2011, university housing at Boise State was seen as a business relationship between the university and students, but it has since been transformed uh, through, through residence life staff to emphasize promoting things like inclusive, safe, and caring communities. Um, and so another way we evaluated residence halls was to look at the biographies for residence hall directors, um, which were available on the university websites. And we found that promotion of social justice um, was really a prerequisite for, the, for hiring residence directors. Um, so just as one example, uh, 
One individual that's a residence hall director, their bio says they are passionate about building safe, inclusive communities where every member has the support they need to be successful. Um, and this individual has also been involved in smearing um, a local business as a white supremacist uh, just because they support the police. Um, and so we found things like this in every residence director's um, bio. And so we concluded that uh, even where students live and sleep is thoroughly permeated with social justice ideology, so much so that residents cannot avoid it in most of campus life. Uh, one thing I would have done differently in this section and plan to do differently as we move on to examine other universities is to look more into what is called living learning communities. Um, and these are basically housing units. They're dedicated to themes like social justice, um, activism, gender, um, global citizenship, things like that. Um, and they often have these things called bias response teams um, who sort of try to enforce the social justice orthodoxy on campus. Um, and then there's one more thing I would have added to this report and plan to add to other reports in the future, which is social justice um, events. So Boise State actually has an entire web page that catalogs social justice events. And the title of the webpage is social justice events. Um, this is something we didn't examine in the report, but um, I think we, we will examine more at other universities in the future. Um, so finally, uh, I wanna touch on some recommendations for reform we include in this report for legislative reform. So we recommend nine pretty practical reforms. Um, these are unique to Idaho, but similar initiatives could work in other states. Um, the really the key to reform to reforming these universities is trying to disrupt the ability for universities to provide stable careers for social justice activists. Um, many people working in higher education, um, they emphasize the need for and the importance of uh, protecting free speech. And we do include free speech as a policy recommendation, uh, but we actually think some other initiatives are more important. And that's largely because free speech could be protected on campus at a public university, but that wouldn't necessarily change its ideological commitments. Um, people that believe in social justice, uh, they regularly object to things like trigger warnings, hate speech to safe spaces. Um, it, you know, they believe, they deliberately reject the idea that colleges should be places where ideas are freely exchanged. They, they believe that, you know, not, not all ideas are equal and some are just too offensive to have a place in community. And so attacks of this sort are obviously designed to shut down free speech and it's just completely antithetical to the existence of free speech. Um, you know, it's advocates, they, they want conformity. So that's why for real legislative reform, you really need to root out the teaching of social justice in these universities. So some of our main policy recommendations in the report include um, restricting funding to public universities that are infused with social justice ideology. Um, the legislature can restore funds to universities that are pursuing their core mission. So in Idaho, uh, the state board defines universities' core missions as uh, protecting academic freedom, advancing truth, and supporting the common good. Um, so you could require universities um, to go back to their mission. And if they do not, they will not receive um, their funding back. You could also require universities to reduce administrative bloat and then prove these changes to the legislature before funding is restored. Um, we also um, suggest that the uh, legislature should adopt a resolution that social justice education does not serve the common good. Um, and this would allow the state boards uh, to differentiate between universities who are following their core mission and then those who are not. Um, another reform we have in here, it, we're calling the Student Choice Initiative. Uh, basically, students are required to pay fees as well as tuition. And uh, we are advocating for students to have a choice over what fees they should um, be required to pay or not. Obviously, some fees like building projects or campus safety or um, campus health centers, students need to pay for. Uh, but there's a lot of other things that student fees funds, like uh, gender equity centers, like LGBTQ centers, multicultural centers, a lot of different things that we are just suggesting students should have a choice to opt out of, um, just to give power back to students so that they can um, decide what they want to see on campus. Um, overall, showing this report to legislators in Idaho, they have been really excited about it. Um, it's influenced them to a point where when they uh, when university presidents came to present to legislative committees, legislators actually asked presidents questions based on our report. Um, so that was a significant change from, from years in the past. Um, 
to legislative reform, it's important, but there's things outside of legislative reform that could also have a big impact. You know, alumni that are concerned about these things, they can stop giving to universities if they don't ag agree with what they are they are doing. Um, and students can also practice resistance in different ways. Um, so part of the goal of this project is definitely to raise public awareness and affect culture in a way. Um, yeah, and so I'll, I'll close by touching on one thing Scott talked about. Um, this project, it began at Boise State, but we're certainly not finished yet. Um, we're examining all the public universities in Idaho. We wanna just determine how far this ideology has gone overall in higher education in Idaho. Um, and we hope that uh, friends in other states will partner with us to further this project so that we can, like Scott said, um, rank, you know, say 100 universities against each other and see, uh, you know, where uh, social justice has the strongest grip and then call, you know, red states to act. Uh, so I'll close with that and I'll uh, give the floor back to you, uh, David. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both so much for your wonderful presentations. I'm going to ask some questions of you first um, before we shift over to audience. And then frankly, I may just you know go back and forth. Um, this is slightly, this is sort of overlapping questions you've already answered, but what did you learn while doing the first report? And you know, and what if you were to do the first report differently, what, how would you do that? Yeah. Um, well, thanks for that, David. I mean, one of the one of the things I think we learned is uh, the need to, to investigate constants. So looking at harassment policies, looking at hiring policies over all the universities, like honing in precisely on the things that each university does so and, and finding the policies that are directly on the, my, my granddaughter is screaming on the other side of the uh, door here, but um, uh, finding the policies that are direct uh, analogs at each of the universities so that they can be compared. Um, I think we, uh, Given that this was our first one, we were a little, I'm not saying we we're flying by the seat of our pants because we had a plan, but uh, I also work at Boise State and I had inside our baseball knowledge of things there that uh, were helpful to put in the report. And, uh, and I, I don't know that that's necessarily the best way to go. I think using the internet uh, as a search engine is, is good. The second thing I think that I would say is that if you can engage legislators in this, um, getting the legislators to ask the university for information works a lot better than Freedom of Information Act. <laughs> um, we could not really get anything out of Boise State when it came to Freedom of Information Act um, uh, applications. And, uh, but when the legislators asked the University of Idaho questions, we got, I think, very good documentation of their reports and plans. So, uh, uh, you know, get the universities to give you the information if you can, because it's very, uh, the stuff that's not online uh, is good to have. And uh, Anna, I know you wanted to maybe talk about the service learning aspect too. Yeah, sure. So we, we mentioned service learning briefly in the report, but again, we don't go very deeply into it, but it's really a significant marker of social justice education because it just shows the slide away from the pursuit of truth and academic knowledge and more towards progressive activism, actually trying to train students to get used to organizing, partaking in activism and pursuing careers in activism. Uh, and so we, you know, like I said, the English department has some uh, requirements for experiential learning or service learning in their first year writing. But I also noticed as I was going through this that a lot of Boise State senior like capstone requirements do have service learning or experiential learning requirements in them. And so um, that's something I think would be really important to go in further um, for anyone else that wants to replicate a report like this, I would definitely suggest including that more. You mentioned, and there's I think a phone call in my background, which I can't attend to and I apologize. Um, you've mentioned uh, the number of courses, four or five that students had to take. I don't think you did a tuition estimate for that. Is that doable? And would that be effective uh, to, for legislators to say, here's the amount of tuition you have to spend on um, you know, social justice courses. You want, you want me to go here, Anna? I'll go. Um, uh, Anna works with the legislature more than I do. So knowing what is effective there is, uh, is really her uh, ballpark. Um, so uh, 
I mean, even that estimate of four or five is kind of difficult. Um, the thing that one of the great things that Anna did, and for those who have the, the, the report, it's on page 18, 19, 20, and 21, is she made a map. And what the map is, is you're, you're an incoming freshman. Here are all of your distribution requirements. And we gave an account of how each distribution is, how much of each distribution is infused with social justice ideology. So just for an example, in the social sciences, 15 out of the 28 classes in their course descriptions have social justice language in it. So the, the thing that you run up against when you, when you give a direct number is the, I would say the lack of knowledge of how general ed works and you're giving a kind of false security or a false certainty on a particular issue. And so I, I've, I've been leery of doing such an estimate like that. I'm not saying I'm against it in principle, um, I'm against it in practice. Because I think really the estimate that we have here and one of the, one of the chatters mentioned this and I think this is totally true. This is a very conservative estimate of how much social justice ideology is on the campus. Just looking at their course descriptions, these things could be 10 years old. We don't know who's teaching these classes. We don't get, we didn't get their syllabus. Um, we didn't record the classes and listen to them. Um, you know, I think there's a deeper way to go into it, but, but to, to get back to your question, uh, David, I think that we're leery of giving the legislators false certainty in this report, uh, though I think uh, we could do it an average and figure out a, a, a total. Do you think that would be persuasive to them, Anna? Yeah, I do think that it's persuasive. I actually, um, I have talked to a few legislators about about this. I think the average cost per credit at Boise State uh, is seven hundred, around seven hundred dollars. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott. But so that means that to take at least four social justice courses, you're paying close to $3,000 to the university just to graduate for, and you're taking social justice courses that you may not want to take at all um, and that you shouldn't have to take. And when I've told legislators that um, they, a lot of them have been like, oh, wow. And they've been, um, it, it definitely gives them a different perspective. So I think that's definitely an important thing to, uh, to calculate and to share because the financial impact uh, is a big barrier for students graduating. I'm going to have a question which um, might be in effect, so inside baseball, you're not allowed to talk about it, but for people who are interested in approaching foundations and getting them to fund and support that, a project like this, can you give them any tips on how people might approach foundations to maximize the chances of success for support? All right, well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give a stab at this. Um, th this came about because uh, there's a friend of mine who uh, I, I talked to about this, who used to be in finance, and I was sitting on his front porch with him at the beginning of COVID. And I said, you know what we need is something like this. And he said, Scott, that's a great idea. And he said, how much do you need to do it? And I, and I said, well, I mean, I just need a underling. I need someone to collect all this data. And, uh, and, and I, uh, the Idaho Freedom Foundation was hiring Anna at the same time. And um, so it was kind of a, she, we now have an education analyst, um, but it was done really cheaply <laughs> because uh, when it comes to data collection, because uh, all of, we, we relied on stuff that was uh, available on the internet. And um, so how to approach a foundation, I think uh, is to talk about the bang for the buck. Um, that uh, we, you know, we ha will have a template for you <laughs> if you want to follow it. Uh, it'll, it, it's not going to be that costly uh, to run the whole report and to use the template. And uh, and we have uh, we have narrative about how you get to the point where you uh, uh, you know can execute the various things that you need to execute within the within the. Uh, plan. We have categories for that are draw you to what you're going to do. So I think there's the big bang for the buck here, and um, and 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 that's what I would probably emphasize. Thank you. I just want to say from the chat, uh, Anna should ask for a raise. I just want to put that onto video for eternity <laughs> so that everybody knows this. Um, <laughs> You mentioned working having with a, me. Is that what it is? Because she has to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned wanna... getting 
a database so, of 100 colleges. And I just want to say to people, there's, I think it's what, in the neighborhood of 4,500 colleges and universities in the United States. So when we're talking a database of 100, that's, you know, that's out of that many. I wanted to follow up, how many public universities are there in Idaho? So you, you say you're going through all of them. How many will that be if you, if you can finish it all? There's four of them. So there's Boise State University of Idaho, Idaho State University, and Lewis Clark State University. So we're planning to do all of them. And just to expand on, on the last point a little bit more, you know, we also are, I am interested at least in doing this work with other organizations. Um, if, if workload is a problem, you know, we want to expand this in other states and we want to help them, show them how to do the template. And so as far as going to foundations, I mean, come talk to us and we can help you at Idaho Freedom and figure out how to get a project like this off the ground in your state. Nifty, thank you. Um, actually, I have a question about housing, actually. This is sort of nuts and bolts, I, again, I suppose, but how many, what proportion of the students at Boise State are on on-campus housing? As opposed to like living off campus. Well, it used to be a strictly commuter school. I would say when I began here, uh, uh, when, when my career began in 2000 at Boise State, um, uh, I, I would guess that the percentage is now above 50% and is probably close to 60%. Um, that, that's another area where we could have done like a deeper job. If we could have find the events that the uh, residence hall directors put on for their, uh, for the, for the people that live in their uh, residence halls, I think that would have been a more powerful thing. Um, but you know, there's, there's only so many hours in the day, uh, but yeah, it's a pretty high percentage. Yeah, I just looked it up, actually. It says 67%. I don't know how recent that is, but 60. So you're right on, Scott. 67% of students living on campus. That's a lot. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to, there's a bunch of questions here on both chat and Q&A. I'm going to switch to them. And I know that the order on my screen has switched since this began. So this is, I'm not going to do this in the order they were posted and I apologize to the people posting questions. Um, there was that question about the, there is, you know, more stuff that is being done that's social justice than, um, you know, is showing in the, uh, you know, what's showing up on the websites. Have you had, you know, and can you get the students to talk about what's being done? Have you had practical thoughts about how to sort of build on this so that you could get reports from students for some later report? Yeah, uh, to me, this is one of those instances of you can't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, okay. This is a conservative estimate. We should be self-conscious that it's a conservative estimate. The amount of work that it would take to take it to the next level, which would, which we actually started to do, uh, which would be to uh, get course syllabi for these particular classes and then look at the readings. You know, that just, it requires kind of a special knowledge that only a few people are gonna have. Oh, like, oh, D'Angelo, this book. Oh no, not, not this, this isn't social justice. So being able to, you know, see the reading list and such would be, I think the next stage but I just think that the bang for the buck there is not worth it, um, uh, at least not at this stage, not at the initial stage of making an initial assessment. Uh, just use their words. Just use their words at this point. And, uh, and because I think if you went to the student experience, look, that would be better. If you could listen to what happened in every class, that would be better. But, you know, I mean, we're not big brother and we can't be everywhere. And uh, it's difficult to get something done, I think, with that level of detail. So, yeah. I'm just gonna mention here, I believe Texas has a state law that all public universities have to provide the um, curriculum on the internet. Um, sometimes they don't do it till after you've already signed up for the course and that, that's a problem too. But I'll just sort of throw out maybe going to the state legislature and asking them to have a law requiring public posting of curricula in all public university classes might be a useful tactic here. Um, I'm going to have a question uh, from Kurt Byron. Considering that it may be difficult to roll back all the social justice programs, would it be worthwhile using the current popularity of the idea of diversity to try to initiate efforts aimed at intellectual diversity? Going once, going twice. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, 
uh, obviously that's the that's we would like intellectual diversity. I think there's a real question of strategy here. Um, and uh, it's something that I've thought deeply about uh, as we encounter uh, uh, people based on this report. And that is, do you want people when they hear the word diversity to, to like want the real version or do you want them to now just hear the word tyranny <laughs> um, and uh, talk about, uh, a, a, use a different word to capture what a genuine educational experience with different viewpoints would represent on the campus. And um, it, I think it's very difficult to mandate intellectual diversity. And, um, and there, are, there are certain ways you can create, I think, centers on campus to do that. Um, but if the university doesn't value it, it's just not going to be um, valued or acted upon. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm leery of efforts to use their categories against them uh, because the, it's proven so futile over the last 15, 20 years. Um, I guess that's my, where I am now on that. Um, but, you know, I could be persuaded otherwise. Okay, Anna, do you want to add to that or? I'll add a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it would be probably a failing um, strategy. I mean, you want a university whose goal is to pursue truth and protect free inquiry and pursuit of knowledge and all of these things. Um, but, you know, I think Hillsdale does that. I think, um, you know, uh, all girls schools do that. You know, I think there's a lot of schools that don't have what they mean by diversity on their campus that are pursuing truth um, and goodness. And so um, I think it's, diversity, as Scott was explaining, is kind of a never ending uh, goal that kind of results in actually kind of tyranny and discrimination. And so I, I think that I don't think that's the best strategy to take. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to a question from Janice. Do you find that most legislators are aware that social justice is an ideology and not just a way to expand tolerance and sensitivity? Or do you have to do a lot of explaining about the critical race theory basis for this trend on campuses? And I'll just add to that, there's a different question. You know, do you have to explain the difference between equality and equity and what equity means that is distinct from equality? I think you definitely um, have to explain those things to people. I mean, I've gotten tons of emails since this came out just asking people or people asking me to define terms. And the purpose of this report was to show that social justice ideology, social justice education exists on campus and how, how deep it goes, not necessarily to prove whether or not it's a good thing, or even, um, we do talk a little bit about what it is, but a lot of people have written about whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and so our goal is to show how far it goes, but um, you definitely have to define those things. Uh, I mean, social justice is heavily influenced by critical race theory, by by cultural Marxism. Um, and so it, and there, there is a difference between equality and equity. And a lot of people don't understand this. A lot of students that have been in the system their whole life, they've never been taught these things. And so it's a big um, it's battle and struggle to, to explain all of this. So there's a lot of catching up to do. Okay. Uh, Scott, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is part of retooling conservatism. Uh, you know, conservatism has long talked about uh, the higher ed reform in terms of like uh, uh, multiculturalism versus freedom. And, and you know, th this has been going on uh, for a while. And, and now it's to the point where we have to say it's social justice ideology or America. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think the heavy lifting that needs to be done isn't just to show which I think a lot of people have done well, James Lindsay and his group have done this very well. What they've shown is that social justice ide ideology can compromise the engine of progress and truth. And, uh, and I think what needs to be written and what needs to be uh, taught to legislators and citizens is how this ideology undermines the idea that we can live together in peace and harmony as fellow citizens in a liberal republic. <laughs> And uh, it's not only harming the advancement of knowledge, it really harms the social fabric and uh, it dishonors excellent citizens. It, um, it compromises the, the tranquility and peace of mind that citizens wanna have and is so close to what it is to live in a civil society. 
And, uh, and I mean, I'm in the process of writing such a thing, but I do think it's a very needful thing because it's a retooling of conservatism, just like Reagan taught conservatives why they should be concerned about, let's say, tax cuts. Uh, today, we have to teach conservatives why they should be concerned about social justice ideology. It's not simply a threat to freedom, though it is, it's a threat to the country. And, uh, and why should we be funding an ideology on these campuses that points to our own suicide? And, um, and so I just think that it, it requires a lot of retooling. Uh, Anna's on the ground in doing that stuff. Um, but you know, I see, the, I see the genuine need for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a, another very specific question, but I think it's, it's worth asking. Uh, which of the Idaho legislative committees, Senate and House, are most directly involved in influencing the funding and control for the four universities? And I ask because that's is the specific question that everybody in every state needs to know an answer to. Anna, I suspect he's pointing at. So in Idaho, um, they have a joint finance committee that reviews university budgets every year. Um, and so that is the, the main committee that will set a budget and then send it either to the House or the Senate to accept, to vote on either accepting or rejecting the budget. In the past, budgets have been rejected, you know, so multiple times, three or more times before they finally pass the university budget. Um, and so that is the committee where most of the control is. It's a joint committee. There's members of the House, members of the Senate on that committee. Um, and they will give a recommendation. They'll most likely introduce it on the House side um, because the House is more conservative than the Senate side. And so they're more likely to reject things. So they often want to fight it out in the House before uh, it goes to Senate. So they know when it goes to the Senate, it'll probably pass whatever it is. Um, but yeah, so they're both, they're equally involved in budget setting, both sides. Thank you. I'm some questions, I think a few of these questions have alluded to this, but I'll just ask this straight out. Idaho, you're going to get a lot of traction, relatively speaking, because it's a red state. Do you have a sense of how tactics ought to be different in a purple state or a blue state, other than despair? Well, there I think the ground has to be laid more. Uh, there, the, the account of why social justice compromises the American future I think is where you have to lead um, that, and then uh, follow with how far it has embedded itself into higher education institutions. Um, the, the advantage insofar as it's an advantage of a red state is that the, there's more bones in it. You know, the, the bones of the legislators and the citizens uh, object to this. They can't necessarily explain why uh, other than they draw a conclusion that is salutary and uh, so I think in other states, you have to lay the groundwork more. And, uh, and I think that's you know, very important work everywhere, uh, but I think it's essential in places where, um, where there aren't ears to hear. You have to make them hear and uh, you have to be persuasive on that issue. Um, so I think there you have to do a dual track. You have to be serious about pointing out the the corruption that proceeds from these ideologies. And then second, show how deeply they're embedded in the universities. I think also expanding on that, I would be really excited to see this project in a purple state because I think in a red state oftentimes, um, I don't know if it's the case in every red state, but I think it's the case here, is that a lot of times legislators can become very complacent and they're sort of afraid to address anything that is controversial or or that might be uh, t take some, some willpower. Um, and I think in purple states, uh, at least Republicans uh, often, or people on both sides are encouraged to, to be bold, to really stand up for what they believe in. They're sort of hardened in a way. Um, and so I, I think it would be really exciting to see this project in a purple state. Thank you. Um, comment, we need to do the same type of study for some repre um, representative high schools and middle schools, maybe even elementary. And I'm going to and personally, definitely elementary, this social justice stuff is also, of course, going throughout the K-12. Um, is, well, is Idaho Freedom Foundation looking into social justice in K-12? Can you think of natural ways to extend this sort of report to K-12 education? 
we're definitely looking at it in K-12. Um, the thing about Idaho, this goes back to a point you made earlier, David, is that it's difficult to know exactly what's happening in K through 12 schools because curriculums are on the website. You know, it'd be great mm -hmm. policy if the legislator told public schools they have to put their curriculum and syllabi up on the website for parents to see not just their curriculum, but their, their specific syllabi and the books that they're required to read and all these things so that parents can decide before they send their child to the school, whether or not they're okay with th what their child is being taught. Instead of all of a sudden in the middle of a semester having their child bring home an assignment and they're um, you know, uncomfortable with it and are forced with the decision to remove their child in the middle of a semester or, or whatnot. Um, I definitely think this, uh, this project could be applied at the K through 12 level. Um, it would be a lot more complicated. It would take a lot longer because obviously there's a lot more uh, K through 12 schools. But I think the priority in K through 12 has to be giving students choice. You know, choice is already the norm in higher education. So students know what's going on in the school. They can easily go somewhere else. In K through 12 education, at least public education, you know, choice is not the norm at all. Um, you go to the school that you're assigned to by your zip code. Um, so if you don't like your curriculum and you can't afford to go to another school, then, you know, tough luck. So I think, you know, our priority right now is getting choice for K through 12 students. Um, and, uh, but, but hopefully in the future, we'll be able to apply an analysis like this. Yeah, the, the head of Idaho Freedom wrote a little blog the other day about Idaho needs a 1776 project. And uh, I really think that uh, we could at least begin by looking at the social studies division of the state education, um, uh, whatever it is, the, the big building in Boise there, the Department of Education. And, uh, and see what kinds of curriculum they're recommending. And, uh, and then following it, I mean, I think the, the thing that would make a K through 12 thing successful on this is a flagging of books and curriculum as objectionable, and then a discovery at a random sample of, uh, of school districts of, of who's adopted that. And uh, it's, it would be difficult, really, to look at every school district. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think that there are methods of doing it. I have some hope uh, that such a thing will happen here over the next couple of years because of the, uh, uh, the, the idea that the 1776 project now has to go to the states. I think we could get support for that. And look, I mean, it's about saving the country as, as, as far as we look at it. And as citizens, we're very concerned with uh, where this is everywhere. So, um, uh, so K through 12 is definitely on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Are these policies violating you know, strict scrutiny in relation to your know, race preferences to sex preferences, you know, civil rights violations. I mean, in effect, they're always skirting the uh, spirit of the law, but are they uh, violating the letter as well? Yeah. Um, so last year, Idaho passed uh, its own civil rights initiative through the legislature. Um, uh, Ward Connerly now lives in Idaho, and he hmm. uh, talked to his representative, and uh, it was passed last year. So that is now state law. And uh, the, the problem, I think, is that, um, is that none of the universities in Idaho are that good. And you have a decent university to practice affirmative action um, uh, when it comes to admissions, uh, because there's a smaller pool of uh, you know, interested applicants um, from uh, under, so-called underrepresented minorities. And, um, and so it's difficult to practice it because the the, they're being gobbled up by schools that are better. And um, in hiring, um, I think that, uh, I think the situation is what you described, David. Um, uh, you know, we want, we, uh, universities will say, we want a woman's studies professor, but it's open as to what kind of, uh, what sex the person is. Um, so when you create a position, you're creating it for someone of a particular demographic group. And that's the way uh, the law has been skirted on that. And, um, and I think it's, you know, I don't, uh, I think you're right, the spirit of the law is being, uh, is being violated. But uh, I don't think that nationally, that's considered to be a violation. And I don't have much hope that the Idaho courts would depart from the national interpretations. Anna, um, same take or slightly anything to add? Um, nope, I agree. Um, 
yeah, I don't have anything to add to that one this time. <laughs> okay. I have a somewhat technical bit from Mitchell Langbert, and I think it's worth doing the, the technical question because one does want to be really good on the technicalities of these. And you know, for anybody wanting to do a similar project, th these are good questions to keep in mind. So a couple of points, says Mitchell. In the future, would it be possible to validate the archival findings with survey data from students as to what is occurring in the classroom? I'm in part thinking that there might be a ritual effect in fields like business and engineering, whereby professors voice social justice rhetoric to satisfy administrators. Hence, comparing students' impressions might be useful. Also, it might be useful to compare colleges in red and blue states, both as to archival data that you are analyzing and samples of survey data. Yes, uh, let me speak to that. That's something I've been thinking about. So the original um, commission report that President Castro uh, had released in 2017, July 2017, was based on survey data uh, among the students. And uh, there were claims, you know, that like 12%, I'm making these numbers up, but it's close to this. 12% uh, of the students felt like they were discriminated against at Boise State. Uh, you know, 3% of the students felt unsafe. And eight, and, and these were seem to be extraordinarily high numbers. Um, and therefore, it justified the, the launching of all of these initiatives. And what I would like to do is every two or three years, reproduce that survey. And, uh, and, and show how the diversity inclusion uh, regime that Boise State is building out is actually compromising the culture, if it is. I mean, I would like, I would like surveys like that done. Uh, conversations have been had about, uh, with funders uh, for such a thing. And, uh, and I expect that, oh, sometime over the next year, year and a half, we will uh, accomplish such a survey uh, I think it's very interesting what the question asker, the, the way the question asker put it, is, is looking at this as a way of validating uh, the archival findings. I think that it could be used like that, but uh, we want to have a little section in here on the campus climate and how it has changed um, over the course of you know, th this uh, plan that the university is adopting. So I think absolutely measuring the opinions of people on the ground is going to be part of this going forward. Thank you. Um, comment from John Fennell. Uh, the key for K-12 to is to influence state curricular standards. This is a heavily bureaucratic process centered in the State Department of Education. Uh, I would uh, agree. I think this is really important. Uh, I, Get, I guess getting back to your plans for K-12, I mean, do you have a sense of how to approach um, the influencing the state curricular standards, you know, whether via the legislature or you know, via approaching the uh, bureau relevant bureaucrats directly? Yeah, so right now Idaho's in the middle of a big Common Core battle, whether or not to get rid of Common Core or what to replace it with. You know, as Scott suggested, they could replace it with something like the 1776 Commission. Of course, a better the real the real problem here is that people are never really going to agree on exactly what should be taught in a public school. But a better way to handle it would be to give power back to parents so that they can go to a school that teaches something they want their children to learn. But certainly in a public school that's supposed to be cultivating good citizenry, um, it makes sense constitutionally to have something like 1776 curriculum that teaches accurate history about America. So I think legislators should definitely look at that. Um, but you know, of course, we. We are not fans of, of Common Core and of state setting curricular standards for every single uh, school in the state because it's just central planning of ideas. And we think, you know, every single school district, every single individual school should be able to meet the needs of the particular uh, body that they're, uh, they're serving, the students that they're serving, the families that they're serving. Um, and so the a really choice is a more powerful tool than just deciding what should be taught in, um, in a public school because then families can go um, where, the, kids can learn something that they want their children uh, to learn about. Um, but I mean, again, if they're getting rid of Common Core is probably not going to, to happen, or at least getting rid of state standards is definitely not going to happen because it's tied to federal money. So um, I think 1776 is definitely something they should look at, at least for their history curriculum. And, and I, I would, John Fennell lives like an, uh, a mile away from me. So hi, John. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, th this is still K-12, and I'm going to ask this 
part one because the people are asking this question and two uh, the, the audience and two because I think they're asking this rightly. I mean I do think that the higher education question of social justice you do also need to consider the K-12 aspects as well but this is uh, from Luke uh, regarding K-12, the Cato Institute sponsored a series of lectures on American history from a classical liberal perspective that was offered to hundreds of high school teachers. They apparently were totally impressed and it was eye-opening. You know, I think the thing was derailed by COVID, but should be looked into. I guess I, to just to broaden that, how effective is teacher education? And I guess, can whatever is being done at the K-12 level be done on the um, undergrad level as well, the higher education level. Oh my goodness, um, that, that's a that's a very interesting question. You know, uh, I often tell my students um, uh, before, uh, so I teach at a university, at, at a university, and uh, I tell my students that one thing about college professors that you have to know is that they're the ideas that they have are much closer to the heart of their identity than any person you'll ever meet. And uh, I'm not saying that they can't learn, but the, the fact that there's disagreement on ideas uh, is gonna rub that group of people the wrong way more than any other group of people that you'll ever meet. And uh, so the prospects to me for fixing this ship after it has sailed, <laughs> uh, that is fixing the, uh, the college professor and getting them to be more interested in the ideas of the American founding or the bases for Western civilization, that's a heavy lift, very heavy lift. And um, I think there is more opportunities for that at the uh, K through 12 level because of the continuing education demands uh, and the fact that people are looking for um, uh, usable curriculum. So if you make an excellent curriculum, you're more likely to get someone to buy it. Um, and that group of people is just less ideological than university professors. And, you know, it's, it's hard to say this because I'm, as I say, I'm a university professor. And uh, so no one can disagree with me or I'll hate you, right? But uh, it's, uh, it's it, 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 I think it's a real fact that, uh, that the, the core of personal identity for a university professor is much more uncompromising than it is for uh, K through 12 teachers. So, um, so I think it's difficult to imagine successful continuing education on that level. Thank you. Um, Anna, did you want to? Yeah, I'll add to that a little bit. Um, I mean, just as far as what's going on in the K through 12 level, I mean, public and some private schools all across the country are giving their teachers anti-racism training, implicit bias training. You know, this has become a norm. You know, I have a very good friend that teaches at a big public school district and they spend hours on anti-racism training and they should be obviously doing, they call it professional development. It's not professional development. It's subversion to a, a, a intimidating ideology. And, um, you know, so it, there, there needs to be some serious reform in the K through 12 level for teacher training as well. Um, they just spend a lot of time convincing people they should feel guilty for having white skin um, or for being a man and instead of actually training them for how to teach students better. Um, or like Scott said, to have appreciation for our, for our founding or um, for ideals of America that are, are worth defending and worth standing up for. Um, so I think Scott covered what's uh, the possibility for higher education is uh, for reforming teacher trainings, um, but ju that's just a little bit on K through 12 and how uh, there's a lot of need for, for reform there as well. Thank you. I, I will go back to higher education now. Uh, a question from Tom Blau, what about the accreditors? And I, this is something I really care about too. So can you say something about the role of the accreditation process in extending social justice ideology. And I'll just say quickly, by the way, for the people listening, there are these seven regional accreditors. It's a semi, which make it possible for colleges and universities to be qualified to receive all the federal money. Um, and it's a semi-autonomous, semi-regulated system and an awful lot of decisions about how the universities are run is done in response to this whole accreditation system. So, Scott or Anna? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I learned most of what I know about this from David and from NAS. So I almost want to throw it back to you, David. Uh, but w whenever I have a microphone in front of me, I got to use it, right? Um, so, you know, what's a remarkable thing, I've been on accreditation committees at, uh, uh, at the university that I work for. Um, and it's remarkable how it's really a closed system. So the creditors look at what the university has promised to do. And then they say, you need to do what you promised to do. And then they also say, why don't you promise to build out a diversity inclusion infrastructure? So then the, the university reacting to the suggestions of accreditors or maybe to the demands of accreditors puts that in there as a plank, something that they're going to pursue. And then, but they don't fund it well enough. So the accreditors come back the next time the, accreditor, uh, the, the school needs to be accredited and say, hey, you say you have a commitment here. Are you living up to your ideal? No, you need to put more resources behind that. And the university goes, oh, don't make me, don't make me put resources behind that. You want me to put resources behind the diversity, inclusion, and equity? Oh, boom, they put resources behind it. So there's a kind of collusion that happens between administration and accreditors you can actually see it in a very greasy way happen on every accreditation visit. And, um, and so accreditors is also really crucial. Now, so, so this is my kind of pushback on that question. I do think it's important. I'm not denying it's important. The problem is once you see the complexity of the whole, you say, well, why do we even bother studying it? <laughs> and, um, and so something, you know, uh, People study the accreditors and we know something about what the accreditors uh, do and what they demand and how they interact with the schools. And I think it's crucial. But if we add to a report on these particular universities, a section on accreditation, we, we create like a huge hurdle for getting something done um, in, in an efficient way that actually still paints a picture about what the university is doing. So I'm not saying accreditors is a distraction. I'm not saying K through 12 is a distraction, but I am saying that in order to get something like this done, you have to narrow your visage and uh, stay in your lane and, uh, and then follow, the, follow the, the road signs. And, uh, and that's what we try to do. And we know that that's, a, that's an intellectual failing and it's an, uh, it's a, it's a blind spot or appears to be a blind spot. We wrote the report knowing about the importance of accreditors. They come up a few times in here, but, uh, but I, think it, I think if we open that can of worms and we never get a report done. All right. Um, I, I will not say Anna this time, but if you want to say anything, you know, jump in. But um, um, this is actually an early question, and I, I, I want to say it because I think it's actually generalizable. From Stephen Elliott, whatever happened to the dominant norms? I find the changes in the last two decades mystifying and alarming. I worked overseas for 15 years, and each time I came home, you know, I noticed some good and some bad changes, but increasingly ones that I felt somewhat uncomfortable in. And I'm saying this be and that it's generalizable because I'm imagining for most people, this is what it's like when they suddenly discover what a university is like, or when they suddenly discover their kids are going to school. And in fact, they've been away from this for 15 or 20 years. They hop back in and what on earth happened? And I, I ask this because I imagine your answer, the way you say this, whatever happened, is something you have to say to any citizen who's just in effect suddenly waking up and finding that the world has changed in the last generation. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'm interested in everyone's perspective on this because I think this is one of the confusing aspects of trying to understand where our world is going. Um, and I'm gonna try to take a longish view of this. Um, you know, Buckley wrote God and Man at Yale in the, in the, what, early 50s? The critique of the university as too hostile to the civilization that gave rise to it is three generations old. And uh, in, in a way, what we are experiencing, you know, Alan Bloom wrote Closing the American Mind in 88. Uh, we could look at that as like a second generation critique of the same thing. And now we're in the third generation. And uh, the way I look at it is that there is no longer any fact to live off of. 
um, the people who've been trained now have been trained by people who never knew the Western tradition. And so universities are going to be uh, fad chasing ideological machines uh, as a result of that. Uh, and uh, this is current reality. How do I explain its uh, sudden rise to prominence? Um, I mean, I don't think a particular event can explain it because it's happening in most places in the Western world. Uh, it seems to be, uh, it, it, so it seems to be universal, like it's uh, been ordained by providence uh, everywhere in, the, in, in our world. And, uh, and, and who, who am I to question uh, the wisdom of providence if it's everywhere, right? Uh, so, um, but I, I do think that what we're experiencing is the, you know, why NAS was founded. Um, uh, it, it is the root of a process pursuit of knowledge has really been against the tradition and, and th therefore very susceptible to ideological Um, I'll elaborate on that a little bit just based on my own experience. I mean, I think people haven't realized how complacent they've become with what they're taught. You know, I was homeschooled the majority of my life. And when I did go to school, I realized that I was the only person in the vast majority of my classes that ever um, dissented. And it wasn't necessarily because I had a superior, amazing education or something, but it's because I was taught differently than everybody else. And I was taught that it was important to critically think and to um, reason about what you believe and not to offload your responsibility for thinking and acting to someone else, especially not um, someone teaching something that's very ideological. And um, so I just think, you know, my experience of going into a classroom and just seeing how everyone is just accepting whatever a professor said to them, whatever side of the aisle they were on, having no willingness to, to debate or to ask sincere questions or something, just accepting it. Um, I think people have just become very complacent. They don't want to bug the status quo. They're afraid to be called a name. Um, and so they just go along with whatever, tell them to. And it's, it's a very serious problem. And so I really resonate with um, the story that uh, that listener um, told about coming back and being sort of shocked because I, I was certainly shocked when I started college um, and had that experience too. Thank you. Question from Terry Gannon. What would, you know, how best could a nonprofit interface with the grassroots effort you have apparently pursued? What would be a good complement to your efforts? The best compliment to our grassroots efforts is if you're an alumni who's been donating to the university or just someone that's been donating would be to stop giving to the university if you disagree with these, uh, their aims. The other thing is um, if you're a student or uh, attending one of these universities would be to, be to practice resistance in some way, um, to not just go along with what uh, trainings you're put through or um, what you're told to do um, by a professor or if you're told how to think or if you're given a bad grade you feel like because not because your argument was bad but because you feel um, that they just dis disagreed with you you know to ask sincere questions about it of faculty members and uh, to try to create change so to resist in a way um, individuals and giving to universities donating to them that's definitely one of the most powerful forces so I would definitely put a lot of weight on that. Scott? Yeah and, yeah, and I just see uh, the, the need for other states to do similar report. Um, I think that really would complement our efforts. I think it can really only be done through, um, through an organization like Idaho Freedom. Obviously, other states have their own uh, think tanks and uh, advocacy groups, but uh, you know, they, have, uh, they have the ability but uh, let me put let me put it like this: As an academic, I have a very narrow audience. But as a person who will publish this through some place like IFF or the Buckeye Institute in Ohio, um, they have an audience. <laughs> they know how to put the work products in the hands of serious people who are closer to decision making. Um, and uh, and so I think it's it's you can't just produce one of these things and expect there to be an effect. Um, and you can't simply create uh, an organization out of nothing in order to make an effect. So it has to be done through some sort of established channel that is uh, interested in academic reform. 
and NAS exists on the national level, there's very few state um, organizations that have the same heft. So uh, the, the kind of think tank that IFF is, uh, is really a logical uh, complement. To put just a point on that, every single state has a think tank, every single one of them, and they all have the same ability, like Scott said, to do what we have done with this report. And we can partner with you. We would love to partner with you. Please reach out to us. Please reach out to this. If you're a citizen, just reach out to the, the think tank in your state and encourage them to do something like this. Tell them that you're concerned about higher education reform and that will you know, encourage them more to look into it and hopefully reach out to us as well. And I should say, by the way, I send email to, uh, to me at the NAS so I can see what, what we can do to be helping this too, you know, spreading the word to other think tanks and so on. Uh, it's an email. Um, uh, some comments people were doing following up, for instance, Vesna Radovich, but students will be punished for resisting. And what do you say to that? Students have been punished for resisting at different universities, um, but it usually uh, becomes a spectacle. You know, here's the thing, you can get punished now and hopefully create some type of change or help other people think a little bit differently, or you can get punished in even worse ways down the road as this ideology advances um, and you're going to regret having not acted. So there's always going to be consequences to your actions. People don't like the truth. People don't like being told that, that um, they're wrong, especially when they're buying into his ideological worldview, but um, you have a responsibility as a thinking person uh, to act and um, bravery definitely inspires more bravery. And so I would be surprised if other people in some way didn't um, rally around you and help you. Thank you. Uh, and, and Scott, did you want to add anything to that or? I was just going to like start talking about souls and Ethan and, uh, but I, I think Anna captured what I would, would have said anyways. Yes, I believe the essay Live Not by Lies by Solzhenitsyn is available on the internet if people want to look that up. It is quite inspirational. Um, the blogger Rod Dreyer cites it often and I think correctly. Um, follow up on the nonprofits and alumni again from Terry Gannon. So how can a nonprofit best take the message to the alumni? Well, that's a little tricky because, you know, of course you can't get lists of alumni from universities and their contact information. So you sort of have to do field research. I mean, we have people that are alumni of universities that we're evaluating here that are donors to us that are changing their perspective, even though they love the university and see so much potential in that university. Um, but they, they want reform. Um, I mean, it's really just spreading the word, you know, speaking out about it, not being afraid to post something about this on social media, not being afraid to have a conversation with your neighbor um, to tell them about what's going on in higher education, um, just spreading the word on the ground, um, teaching it to your children, um, all of that. There, a comment then, you know, I, do, I think part of the, Lotus Jones, I think part of the problem is that the educational system doesn't teach people to think critically. You know, if it did, all classrooms would be structured differently. I'm going to add to that, that of course, critical thinking is an endless mantra now, except they mean, what they mean is we criticize a particular point of view, you know, anything conservative, traditional, you know, pro-civic American, and, you know, we, we have mindless support for ours. I guess my follow-up is, can one, can one be, say one's in favor of critical thinking at this point without getting caught in the, the, this horrible simulacrum of it? And is there another word we could use? Or, or, and if we are going to use the same word, how, how precisely would one teach critical thinking what are the principles by which we can define it, which will avoid having it be captured, uh, you know, to mean propaganda and conformity? Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I'm only 50 years old, but this question makes me feel very old. Um, uh, the way I, the way I think about that is that, you know, an education structured around functions isn't the education we fought for. Uh, we want, it's an education uh, around knowledge of particular things. And, uh, you know, it'd be great to be able to read Dostoevsky or Shakespeare. It would be great to know what the Federalist Papers argue about constitutional government and how it was criticized by Woodrow Wilson. It's great to know particular things. And in the knowledge that we have of particular things, we think and we ask questions about who's right and who's wrong. 
and uh, and that thinking, I guess you could call critical thinking. And so, I mean, I think in the ideal circumstance, we'd want to say that uh, education has content, and we wouldn't want to judge the success of an education or even the um, the image of an education based on functions that we want to get out on the other side. Those functions are kind of an accidental byproduct of the actual engagement that goes on in classrooms and in writing and um, in discussions. And so I think, you know, my view of this is that once you get on the function bandwagon, um, it's, uh, it's a losing battle for those who want to uh, have an education that enriches in the culture and, uh, and is, it reflects a knowledge of what has come before us and what is possible and what's not possible in the future. And uh, so, as I say, it's very, it's kind of an old school answer, uh, but uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, Anna, did you want to add? I don't have anything nope. to add on this one. I have a, um, going, getting back to the practicalities, how long did it take you to do the Boise State Report? How long do you think it'll take you to do the University of Idaho? How long do you think it'll take you to do all four colleges? Boise State took maybe three months. Um, and of course, this is the longest it will take us to do one of these reports. Maybe it was four months, but... Um, it, because we had to come up with the design, which is uh, takes way longer than you would think it would. Um, and we ha had never done this before. We didn't really have a template. And so we were doing everything for the first time. And um, Scott discussed this a little bit earlier, but we didn't know that filing a public records request was necessarily the wrong way to do things because it would take 25 days or more to get information back. Instead, we should have gone through a legislator and things. So in the future, going through this report, um, we're basically just using this framework applying it to another university, but we don't have to start from scratch. So it'll be much faster. Um, I think maybe uh, we've only been working on University of Idaho for a month and I think maybe one more month and we'll have it done. So um, we haven't quite cut our time in half, but but almost for the rest of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, to, to build on that, you know, some parts of the narrative are reproducible so that uh, the, the, the pages on why we would study this, we can use in each study the pages on what you look for when it comes to the administration or student life can be done with very minimal changes to each, uh, for each university. But everything had to be done for the first time when it came to Boise State. I finished um, you know, the first three sections of the University of Idaho one uh, in probably 13 hours. Um, and that included reading a stack of reports um, from the, uh, the strategic plan for diversity and inclusion, uh, showing how it changed from 2004 to 2019 um, and kind of tracing it. I had my wife sit next to me and read uh, the planks of one report while I looked at the other report to see how there were changes, 19 pages of uh, reading together. But, you know, it just took 40 minutes and, uh, and then it kind of writes itself because you have timelines and goals. So, um, uh, uh, so anyways, that, that's, uh, that's, I think, you know, we, it wasn't the only thing on either of our plates for those four months. I mean, I got a book published in those four months. I write on the side. I teach full time. Anna has other projects. Uh, and I think if you boiled it down to hours, we'd probably be talking for Boise State. I don't know. On my end, it was probably 70 hours. Um, and it, prob it was probably more on Anna's end because she was more involved in the design. But now that, and, and at the end of the course, it was just a disaster at the end. You know, you're, we, we have all the text done and now we're trying to fit it into this, uh, fit it into the design we have. And there's this change, a little change here, a little change there. So uh, we don't expect we're gonna have those problems as we move forward. All right, well, it's 3.29. I guess I, I would love to have the two of you each say something to conclude for the audience and then I would, and sort of wrap it up and say goodbye and thank you. So Anna, do you have anything to say first by way of conclusion? Yeah, just thank you so much for having us. Um, I can't emphasize enough um, how much it would mean to work on this project in other states. Um, we would love to, to further this project, to rate other colleges. Um, you know, 
if you have ideas, if you're working on this in your state um, or want to send me an email, Anna at IdahoFreedom.net is my email. Um, so contact me anytime. Um, and thank you guys so much for listening and for being invested, invested in, um, in this work. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I amplify that. Uh, thank everyone for coming and uh, don't be a stranger when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, advice or, uh, you know, looking at the report or we, we'd, we'd be happy to help. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, a very important thing. It's late in the game is the way I look at it. It's late in the game in this republic. And this is, um, this. I don't know if it's one of the things that's gonna put the knife to it, uh, if the knife is already in it, but, uh, but this ideology is not something that can uh, be our reigning ideology and we can live together in a liberal republic together. And uh, so I think it's just a matter of grave importance. And, uh, and this is um, therefore important work uh, that I encourage all citizens uh, to engage in and to contact us uh, uh, for help if they would like some. I chatted my email out, um, so take a look. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, so and I said at the beginning, please get in touch with me also, randall at nas.org. I'm also glad, delighted to pass on uh, queries to people. Um, this is a extraordinarily important work. We're deeply gratified and delighted that the Idaho Freedom Foundation has been doing this, that Scott and Anna have been doing this. Thank you so much for your work. And, and your, don't your forget the Claremont, work. don't forget the Claremont Institute. Uh, <laughs> uh, who uh, for whom I work, they're uh, they're responsible for uh, you know supplying me. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're they're very good people too. Uh, can't, can't can't say enough good things about them. Anyway, thank you so much, and um, we will also be continuing to spread the word. You know, whenever you do later reports, we will also be trying to tell people about them so that people can continue to know about your work going forward. So. I'm going to say thank you so much, and I think I am going to uh, 